Hello, Hello and, and welcome, welcome to TEDx Technical University of Denmark. My name is Trent and I'll be your host for today. I'm going to be introducing you to the speakers list and generally keeping you appraised of the program. So if anything strange happens, we're in a you know corona situation at a technical university, so something technical will go wrong. So uh, I'm here to make sure that you know what's going on. But to get us started officially and properly, it's my honor to welcome to the stage one of the main organizers of this event, Vipor. Vipor, come on down. Thank you, Trent. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first ever conference at DTU. So uh, without further ado, we will be starting. And throughout the day, you will be listening to some great speakers uh, and, yeah, and their insightful talks. So before that, uh, I think we should present you with the Chris Anderson uh, TED Talk, where he will be talking about his uh, TED experience and giving you an overview of the TED. So let's begin. Hello again. Let's get straight into it and go straight to our first speaker. If you've ever given a second thought to your bones or vital organs, then you're going to love this next guy. His name is Morten Corsdale, and he's had over 24 years' experience in college and research, and is connected to the University of Southern Denmark. Without further ado, Morten, come onto the stage. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So. I love collagens, and I think you should too, because they are really the key to understanding and treating chronic diseases. So what is a collagen? To start with, I would like to introduce you a little bit to the importance and the biology of collagens. So what do you think of when I mention collagens? I think many of you may be thinking about skin products. We want beautiful skin. We want beautiful collagens. But collagens are so much more than that. They are, in fact, the central building block of all biological structures. Just like the Eiffel Tower, where the beams and the pillars are completely essential for the structure of the Eiffel Tower. In fact, collagens are the main building block of the body. And type 1 collagen is the main protein in the body. And these proteins are the small building blocks that the entire body is made of. In addition, you might know that we are made of more than 30 trillion cells. And many organs actually have more of the matter outside the cells as compared to the cells. This outside the cells, this context is referred to as extracellular matrix. And this matrix is critically important for the function and the behavior of those cells. In fact, collagens are the central component of this matrix. And the cells, they know how to behave because of this matrix. In fact, if we look at cells, all cells have the same DNA. They have the same capacity to turn into a bone cell, a brain cell, a skin cell, or a muscle cell. And the reason why they know how to behave and what to do is because of the context, because of the matrix that they are in. So these cells only know how to function and when to live or when to die because of the context they're in. In fact, there are 28 different types of fantastic collagens, and they are all different in different organs, in different parts of those organs, and, and I'm going to take you through a, a few of those. So let's take bone as an example. Type 1 collagen is the main component of bone. And if we have a lesser quality of collagens, or if we lose our collagens in bone, the bones break. So at least we need to take care of our collagens. So I started my, my research in bone more than 20 years ago. And this is actually my second publication. More than 500 have, have come since then, but I didn't think I realized the importance of this when I, I first saw this publication. In fact, on, on this slide, you see, you see completely the same type of cells. To the left, the cells are on plastic, you can see the black spots, and they are flat. 
However, when those exact same cells with the same DNA are put in a collagen gel, they start looking like completely different cells. These cells look like the bone cells you saw on a previous slide, and, and they start to behave different. So very clearly, the collagens control the form, the function, uh, and what these cells are doing. So the collagens control cells. And this is the first premise of what I'm going to say today, that the matrix, what is around the collagens, they control cells. The second part is we regenerate. Think of your body as a construction site. There is demolition and repair ongoing all the time. In fact, um, we regenerate so much that the liver can regenerate if, uh, from just 25% of uh, remaining liver. Also, the, the bones regenerate. Every 10 to 25 years, we actually get new bones. And moreover, uh, the intestines actually regenerate every week. So this construction site, where we have demolition and repair ongoing every day, I mean, we need that to be in a perfect balance. If we just have a little bit more demolition in some organs, we lose that organ function. And if we have too much repair, then we have a different disease. And this balance and this demolition and repair, if that is out of balance, is actually what causing uh, chronic diseases. In fact, this demolition and repair is so important and ongoing all the time that you are not the same self you are today as you were 9 a.m. this Monday morning. So when this balance is out of control, this leads to chronic diseases. Chronic diseases are diseases that last a lifetime and that need to be managed. In fact, um, uh, if by the age of uh, over 65, then more than 80% of us will have at least one chronic disease. And what is the common denominator of these different uh, uh, diseases? It is that collagens have changed. There are different amounts of collagens in cancer, diabetes, autoimmune diseases with destruction of the, of the bones and in liver diseases. We see in these different uh, diseases that the collagens have changed. And moreover, we see that the collagens are continuing to change for the worse. And this means that the tissue composition and the collagens of balance is altered. The repair balance is, uh, is disturbed. And this is the central concept, that we are constantly regenerating. And that regeneration leads to that collagens are broken down and they are built up. And so in this beautiful slide, you see cells on the top and you see the structures of collagen below. And so when these tissues are being remodeled, then small collagen fragments are being released from the tissue into the bloodstream where we can use these as biomarkers. Biomarkers are just a simple measurement, just as weight or blood pressure, but it is a objective measurement of a biological process, and we researchers use them as biomarkers, and we use them every day. So interestingly, if, if so many of us have or are going to have a chronic disease, how come we are so bad at at treating them and even curing them? Well, I think it's because we are, we are looking at the tip of the iceberg, not what lies beneath. The cells are only a small part of what's going on. Actually, there's more matrix than cells. So it is essential to understand chronic diseases that we're not just looking at the cells, but we look at the context, the matrix, and the collagens. And this is the second premise that we regenerate and this generate collagen fragments that tells us about the processes that may lead to chronic diseases. So let me give you three biological examples of what the collagen balance means for patients uh, and how important this collagen balance is for patients. And before we go there, I want to take a deep dive into how a collagen truly looks because they are unique and fantastic molecules with a structure 
uh, as you can see, that is unique for collagens, and they have this structure, so they are, they are strong proteins that are the essential component of all tissues. So, and this is where we have been wrong all these years. We just measured a protein, a collagen. We did not take care in separating the processes of tissue demolition and tissue repair. Because when we look further at these collagens, it's very obvious that there are some fragments that are associated with repair and some fragments that are associated with demolition. So to truly understand which processes are driving to chronic diseases and which processes that we need to interfere with to reverse or even cure chronic diseases or even regenerate organs, we need to understand the collagen fragments. So I'm going to give you three examples. The first one is bone. I started in bone research more than 24 years ago. And, and what you see up here is, is a healthy bone and a bone with osteoporosis. Type 1 collagen is, is the most abundant protein in bone. And, and what you can see is that the collagens have been lost in the, in the bones that are going to be fracturing. And so if, if we lose collagens, uh, then the bones are going to be fracturing. So we measured the collagen balance in thousands of, uh, of these individuals. And what we found was amazing. We found that these patients that were going to have a fracture and that were losing bone, they had more bone formation. Not lower bone formation, but more bone formation. And even more so, they had... Uh, and so why were, they, why were they losing bone? Then we measured the degradation fragments. And it was because that they had even higher degradation fragments that they were losing bone. In fact, all bone treatments today are rebalancing this balance. All bone treatments today are either giving you less bone destruction or more bone formation and rebalancing this important balance. So more collagen fragments. We've been looking into cancer, and this has been an amazing experience. So the premise that we are not just measuring the protein, but specific fragments is in particular true for cancer. So we looked at a collagen, and we looked at two different fragments. One fragment meant that the patients were going to die, and another fragment of the same protein meant that the patients were going to survive. This means that had we just measured the intact collagen, we would not have known what was going to happen. So one fragment of repair is associated with processes that are going to make those patients live, and another fragment is bad processes that are going to make that patient die. That means that we can, can look at those collagen fragments and we can see which treatments those patients are going to be responding to, and this will have an enormous impact on the life of, uh, of cancer patients. So I, I want to go to, to chronic diseases again, because this is the central premise. There are balances of demolition and repair, and those balances are resulting in different fragments of collagens, some that are important for regeneration and some that are important for destruction. And in fact, in all chronic diseases, in liver disease, lung, kidney, skin, we have seen that these fragments are altered. Either the balance of repair is a little too much or there's too much destruction of tissues. And in fact, for all these diseases, for liver, lung and kidney, we have seen that treatments that are actually truly efficacious are changing the collagen balance. So for those treatments not just to be symptomatic, they need to change the collagen balance, just as in bone. So this is the third premise, really, that collagen fragments is like a crystal, a biological crystal ball. I mean, if we know the collagen balance of formation and degradation, we can actually see if, if we're going to develop a chronic disease, we can see if we are reversing a chronic disease, and we can see if, if patients are responding to a given treatment in chronic diseases, including cancer. So in the end, I mean, this constant regeneration and repair means that we collagen fragments are generated in the body all the time. 
some for demolition and some for repair. In fact, uh, during this talk, I have, I have generated uh, more than a billion cells. And who tells the, the cells what to do? The collagens do. And those collagen fragments, formation and degradation, allows us to look into the future and see what's going to happen. So before I end, I just want to thank the many PhD students, the postdocs, uh, my directors, and all the collaborators that, that through these last 24 years have, have helped us trying to understand the biology and co of collagens and how they may help us to change the life of patients in a completely new way. May the collagens be with you. Hi, Mon. Thanks so much for that talk. That was super interesting. Thank um, you. It got me thinking, though. We've had a talk outside of the stage mm -hmm. uh, scenario here. Yep. Uh, and you said that you've done about 24 years, I can see 30 years even, decades at least, of research in collagens, and you feel like you haven't quite reached that sort of uh, tip of the iceberg yet. You mm -hmm. don't know what's out there. What do you think is waiting around the corner? So uh, we have been looking at these collagen fragments in blood, and, uh, and we've been using them as as a biological science of what's going to be happening in the future. I mean, we call them biomarkers. And interestingly, we see that some of these biomarkers are elevated in many diseases. Mm. And it turns out that some of these fragments are not just biomarkers. They actually specifically interact with cells. There are some research groups, including ours, that have now found collagen hormones. So it's, it's we, we used to be thinking that the matrix was like the Eiffel Tower, it was there. But when it's fragmented, there's a new biological meaning coming out of that. And there's actually specific receptors affecting those collagen fragments. So I think if I were to dream, then in the future, we would see that we are using actually signals of the matrix to treat and cure some of those chronic diseases. Wow, okay, so collagen is not just face cream. I <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Morten. Thank you very much for having me. to you. Please uh, exit stage thank left. You. Right. Because I know it's All right. Um, let's move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker today uh, is going to give us a little bit of insight into the origins of creativity, or at least creativity for him. Uh, he's going to show us that creativity is might show up in places where you don't really expect it. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Christian Faber. Uh, he is a, a self-proclaimed story starter. He uh, doesn't like to be called a storyteller, a story starter, because he says he starts stories. Uh, and he's also an author. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I brought my backpack because uh, we are going on a journey. Uh, 50 years of creative research uh, in the sea of creativity. And um, first, I want to try to explain the brain and how I see the brain uh, through all this creative journey. Uh, I've sort of done a new kind of model, and I would like to show it to you. So maybe you will think about the brain in a different way from after this. Uh, this is sort of the typical picture of a brain. You have the two sides, left and right, or whatever you call it creative or, and structural, and uh, I would like to look at, at it in a totally different way. I would like to split it up in two parts, and I would like to call it the known and the unknown. And this can actually give us sort of a visual presentation of the journey we're on, because this is a journey that's inside the brain. You don't need, any, uh, you don't need to cross any borders. This is an unlimited journey. So if you look at it as one of the side of the brain is a boat, it's the safe place, you can keep all your stuff, uh, and then you have the sea, and you take the boat and you place it in the sea, and then you actually have a working model for this creative travel. Most people have sort of a, sort of a limited uh, kind of, of sea, uh, and it's controllable, it can give you a bit of, a, of a waves and so on, but it's, it's, it's pretty uh, sort of controllable, and you can see the edge of the sea. And uh, the thing that happens when you, uh, when you grow up, you tend to sort of go into this situation where uh, the amount of, of water <laughs> that you can move in is sort of shrinking and you think, okay, you, my boat is safe, it's, uh, 
I know my stuff, everything is, uh, is in place. But the stuff that, the things that happen to me is that my C just keeps uh, getting bigger and bigger. And from the very beginning, when I was standing on, uh, on the boat uh, in my young, uh, young years, I was looking into the sea and I just wanted to jump in because there was so much opportunity in here. And the great thing is that um, I brought this. The only tool you need is a pencil. And this pencil is totally magic because at one end it has a focused uh, delivery point of product. In the other end it has infinite possibilities. So having this in my hand, I jumped into the sea. And uh, this is me at, at four years old in the first picture. And this other drawing I did uh, a couple of years ago uh, to try to explain the freedom you have uh, in this sea. And you don't need to use a pencil, you can use all kinds of material. So, so this, uh, this travel agency is 24-7, uh, it's low cost, and it's immediate. You can go anywhere. So this is the amazing power of the brain. And I can clearly say my starting point for my journey came when I was sitting watching the black and white TV, and uh, Jacques Cousteau came on with his uh, adventures in, uh, to the edge of the world and beyond. And uh, this totally sparked a dream that you could actually, you could live in the sea. You didn't have to stay, uh, stay on the boat. So watching these things, uh, it, it totally connected me with water. And I basically think that water is the creative substance. It's a, it's a magical place. And uh, yeah, you know, when you're in water, you are happy, uh, sort of on a general uh, scale, uh, sort of, uh, it, it sort of, it induces happiness. Uh, so I could hear yelling from the boat. You know, my parents were standing up there. Come up, come up! You can't, you can't stay in that sea. You have to get an education. You have to learn about uh, life. You know, the real way. You have to dry out those, that water. And uh, but I was staying there, and I was I had actually spotted a possibility because there was this amazing uh, vehicle uh, circling around in the creative sea, and it was called advertising because this was a safe place you can crawl inside this amazing yellow submarine, and you could actually stay in creativity world and actually make a living at the same time. So I crawled inside and uh, yeah, this was an amazing place. I walked around Copenhagen with my drawings, looking at all the different agencies and they say, get an education, get an education. And the last place I went, they actually liked what I did and they invited me in. And this happened to be the most fantastic agency in the world because they had the most amazing client. Yeah, I'm talking about uh, a toy company called Lego. And um, a little uh, time later, I actually uh, had another experience because I started to get this uh, blind spot on my retina. And imagine this uh, living the dream and living the nightmare at the same time. I went into uh, to the hospital and uh, was put inside a MI scanner and um, I had a look into my brain, so this was really a, it was an amazing experience because it showed me that it was something that shouldn't be there, uh, but um, at the same time, it gave me a totally creative uh, look on the world because uh, you need to take your weakness and use it as creative fuel. This was the kind of picture uh, you, you don't want to take home when you are 20 years old. But this was uh, looking inside my brain and there was something not supposed to be there. It was a tumor. It was pressing on the pituitary gland uh, and it was pressing on my uh, 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 optical cord. So at the same time, I was opening up the creative world. I was getting shut down from inside. This was really, really uh, not a good development. Uh, but I found out that uh, the body is basically made out of chemistry. So I've uh, put a little extra sentence in this, in this, to be or not to be, that's a matter of chemistry. Uh, because I got these pills, I got these uh, capsules that I was eating every day. And they uh, were starting to, like, uh, like an army of uh, small medical soldiers going into my body and fighting this uh, tumor. This was really amazing. It was not cancer. So uh, I had really the feeling of being reborn when I went out of that hospital again. But the chemistry had an effect, it had a side effect. And I want to rephrase uh, survival of the fittest because my experience was survival of the weakest. 
uh, I had to sort of uh, almost crawl my way into the agency because every morning uh, I would feel like a zombie because of the medicine. And basically, my next uh, object I will take forward is imagine being uh, in an advertising agency where you know everything is about uh, you know fantastic living and uh, colors and so on. But when I came to the agency, I crawled into the bathroom and I took this. And you know you can apply creativity in a lot of ways because you can use this as a pillow as well. So I was lying uh, in the bathroom of the agency with my head on this. And that also redesigns another sentence, uh, being on a roll has another meaning. Um, I was on this roll for 10 years, eating the medicine and uh, making strange connections in my brain, which actually led to this next development. Because our fantastic uh, client uh, had this series of uh, mechanical or biological uh, heroes made out of uh, parts, um, and it needed a story, it needed a universe. So why not take the capsules that I have been eating for 10 years and make them into uh, this product? It's gone off the market, so I, this is not advertising, but this is, uh, this is Bionicle, and it's a biological chronicle. So taking the disease, taking the story of the, of the, of the body that had to be rebuilt, and put it into sort of a legendary uh, setting. Uh, that is what Bionicle is about. And this uh, story had a 10-year uh, run with a lot of fans around the world, and uh, it's still actually out there. A lot of fans have continued to build. And uh, yeah, those people are going into education now. They are taking uh, classes in 3D modeling and so on, and they, uh, I'm still in contact with them, so this is fantastic. This is actually the secret behind the whole Bionicle uh, uh, legend, that you have this gigantic robot lying underneath the sea. The island that the, the heroes arrive at is, um, is the face of the robot, and uh, the whole fight is about getting rid of the virus that's in this robot. So taking the illness into storytelling is a fantastic uh, way of, of coping with the with problems and weaknesses and uh, biological, uh, yeah, adversary. But what happens when you're in this submarine of advertising, uh, you start to develop another blind spot. And that's actually, uh, that's actually an uh, entitled blind spot. And I think it's, it's a problem of a lot of uh, the Western culture. That, you know, we think that everything is okay. We, we are sort of We are on the boat, we have everything safe, we, uh, we have a pleasant uh, everyday life. I know there's a lot of trouble right now with the COVID, but I will get back to that. Because uh, this was what happened to me. I had to get back into the water, I had to get, get sort of this numbness out of my uh, fingers. And I had to sort of go back to depending on this one. So when I went out back into the water and looked back at the boat, I suddenly saw this. This is sort of a representation of the whole human civilization being on a cruise, which a couple of years ago was sort of a perfect uh, vacation form, but now it's more like a, a horror movie <laughs> being secluded on, on, this, on this boat. But this is actually civ uh, civilization in a, in a nutshell. And uh, you can find everybody uh, on the globe in this drawing. Uh, some will be under the waterline, some will be on top inside the gyrosphere. And some will be in the front looking for the future, trying to uh, get the other ones to react. So based on this thing, I will say that creativity has a totally new role. Uh, it used to be advertising, selling stuff. It used to be entertainment. But now we, have, we are on a quest for humanity. And the creative people, everybody needs to be on this. Because uh, we need to use the water as a mirror to look at ourselves. And um, we also, oh, this uh, text has jumped a bit. <laughs> we need to move from hero to Vero. And what I mean with that is we have been searching for heroes to fix our problems for years and years of our civilization. But I think we're getting to the point in 2021 where we realize that it's actually us. It's the we that needs to take care of stuff. And I can see uh, traces of this all around. You can see young teenagers fighting for... Uh, 
climate change, uh, you know, getting that on the, on the agenda. You can see old scientists uh, doing TV programs about uh, nature that is uh, disappearing. You can see uh, all the scientists uh, doing the vac vaccines and so on. These are, these are sort of uh, heroes that are at attracting attention to the we, that we need to accept that we are together in this. So I really want all the creatives on the, on the globe to unite. Uh, we have this one boat we are sailing in and we need to use creativity to, to make change. So the story I really want to tell is that going on a rescue mission in the near, near future, you can imagine having your near relative in the future lying in this uh, uh, orange uh, safety raft and you are maybe controlling the drone on top, trying to save this, you know, distant relative. And you have a windmill, which is like a new energy. In some years, it will be the old way, old way of doing things. Maybe it will be the safe haven for, for this uh, future relative. I'm actually inviting everybody into this new creative uh, storytelling project, inspired by the global goals. And uh, it's actually about our everybody's uh, near future and our unborn children. <laughs> and the world they're going to live in, we should tell stories about that. We should focus on that and creativity should become a serious science. So uh, the last thing I want to take off of my uh, bag here, that is uh, we've been giving this fantastic gift of the global goals. And I really want to say to people, don't make this into a blind spot. Don't just put it on your, on your jacket as a little symbol and then you're safe. This is, this is a fantastic story engine. It's a story starter and you should play with it. Uh, you should put it into action. So uh, for the next slide, be ready for the future, tell the stories and uh, keep this in your hand. Then you will be safe in the water of creativity. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. That was uh, that you. was very inspiring. Uh, I got to say straight up, I'm a little starstruck. I was a kid when I think Bionicle came out. Not to sort of you know tell you how old you are there, but but uh, so it's 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 pretty amazing to meet someone who's actually doing it and hear the process behind it. Yes. Um, I'm wondering though, like you just mentioned a, a, a storytelling initiative you've got going there, or, or yeah, storytelling initiative. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what's your advice to people that want to uh, start being creative if they feel like they want to sort of, you know, let's say uh, boost their creative, supercharge their creativeness. What's your advice to them? I really want uh, them to look at, uh, don't look at your strengths, look at your weaknesses, look at all the stuff that doesn't work mm -hmm. in your life, or maybe that. A uh, thing that is really irritating, uh, thing, a thing you do, if, if you're nervous about being on stage like this, you know, take that. That is actually your best advantage because I think your, your weaknesses and your faults make you unique. It's not your strength because then you're fighting towards sort of a, uh, the top of, of, of the iceberg as we saw uh, in, the, in the other talk. You know, there's so much below that and, and, and all the struggles are your own and that's your story. So I think people should, should, should use their weaknesses. So actually becoming a, we a hero instead of a hero <laughs> is much more important. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that's advice to live by, guys. Um, right, for now we're going to have a little bit of a break and then in about five to six minutes we'll have our next talk going on. So uh, stay tuned, we'll be right with you. Welcome back. I am uh, happy you're back with us. Hopefully you haven't left us and you're still there. But uh, yeah, after the last speech, it kind of makes me want to think I should write that book I've been thinking to write for 20 years. Uh, but you know, writing books are stressful and I really don't like stress. But our next speaker has a little bit of a different take on stress that might relieve that kind of pressure. So uh, our next speaker is someone who graced the stage in 2013 first. Uh, her name is Kelly McGonigal and she's going to talk a little bit about uh, how to make stress your friend. Well, I am definitely going to try and make stress my friend. I just really hope that stress sees me as their friend as well. But that pretty much concludes our first uh, row of speeches for now. We hope you've been enjoying it so far, and we apologize, of course, for the technical difficulties, but uh, thank you for bearing along with us. We really appreciate it. For now, though, we're going to send you off on a break. Uh, go away from the computer, close your eyes, walk out, grab a coffee, tea, or some other kind of cozy beverage, 
and uh, and just yeah, have a little uh, break from your screens. Um, but please meet us back here at around 12 o'clock. Not around, actually, 12 o'clock sharp. I've just been uh, given the dagger eyes by the organisers. 12 o'clock sharp uh, would be fantastic. We'll see you very soon. Hey, folks, and welcome back. I hope you had a good little break away from the screen because the next hour or so is going to keep you glued to it with the amazing talks we're about to listen to. Let's move on to our next speaker. Cancer sucks. There's no two ways about it. But imagine if there was a treatment out there that could look at your exact biology and your exact cancer uh, cells and treat that as it is. We might almost be there. To tell us a little bit about it, we have Emma coming over to the stage right now. Emma is going to talk to us about a uh, specialized treatment of cancer. Come on over, Emma. Let me give you a sneak peek into the future. In the future, everything will be truly personalized. In the future, we will be designing one therapy for each individual patient. Personalization is now becoming a reality due to the advancements in artificial intelligence, or AI. AI is enabling us to develop cancer therapy that are specifically tailored to the individual patient based on the genetic code or the DNA of the individual. We can use the wealth of information contained within the DNA of the individual to tailor the therapy to that specific cancer patient. But now you may ask yourselves, how do we get from the DNA of an individual cancer patient to a personalized cancer therapy using AI? In order to understand this, let's take a step back and look at cancer therapy. In a traditional cancer therapy approach, such as chemotherapy, we're using a one-size-fits-all model. These types of therapies target cancer non-specifically, which, um, which causes side effects and is not always effective in fighting off the cancer. The challenge, however, is in cancer and in tumors, tumors, each tumor is unique, and we can argue that a more effective therapy can de be developed if we treat the tumor as such. In a personalized approach, we want to target each patient uniquely. More importantly, we want to target each tumor uniquely. We basically want to look at the foreign elements that are displayed on the surface of the tumor cells and target these. These foreign elements arise from mutations that can be caused by, for example, env environmental factors such as sun or smoking. Mutations are completely normal events in the human body, and we have developed many mechanisms to mitigate the potentially dangerous actions that these mutations can have. However, in cancer, these one or more mutational events have not been mitigated, and this can result in the development of a potentially malignant tumor. Tumor cells are disguising themselves as normal cells. This means that Tumor cells are putting up a protective shield, allowing them to attract all the essential nutrients they need to grow, allowing them to ultimately grow out of control. The immune system cannot recognize the tumor cells as foreign. Our immune system consists of so-called T cells. And T cells constantly survey the body and monitor whether there's any danger lurking. They are experts in finding foreign intruders that are trying to invade the body, such as bacteria and virus, virus such as the coronavirus, which I guess you are all ex experts in now in light of the pandemic. In cancer, the tumor should in principle be just as foreign to the human body as a virus is, but somehow it is not. The tumor goes unnoticed by the immune system. The tumor is in disguise. We want to design personalized cancer therapy that helps the immune system see the tumor. We want to help the immune system see the foreign elements on the surface of the tumor cells. And we want to boost an immune response that makes sure that we have the right T cells present and enough of the T cells present to actually fight off the tumor. In a personalized cancer therapy, what we want to do is we want to develop a therapy specifically designed based on the genetic code of the DNA of the individual patient. 
We want to bring this, these foreign elements that are on the surface of the tumor, we want to bring them out in the open. And the way we do that in a personalized cancer therapy approach is actually by providing the body with more of this foreign material, exactly as we would do in a vaccine against coronavirus. So let me illustrate what these foreign elements actually are. These foreign elements are what we call neoepitopes or new epitopes. And epitopes are small molecules that are displayed on the surface of our cells in complex with a specialized immune molecule called MHC. Neoepitopes or new epitopes have arisen from mutations in our DNA and then they are displayed on the surface of the cells in complex with these MHC. Each cancer patient or each tumor of each cancer patient is defined by a unique set of neopitopes. And also each patient has a unique set of MHC. It's only a subset of the molecules that are bound to the MHC or displayed on the surface by MHC that are actually neopitopes. And identifying these of, uh, is a hugely complex task. Also, the immune system being able to see these is also a, a highly complex task for the immune system. Imagine that these neopitopes are screaming at the top of their lungs, trying to inform the immune system that there is danger. The neopitopes are trying to tell the immune system that there's something wrong with this cell, there's something wrong with this tumor cell, and that they should immediately kill the cell. The problem is, however, that these, this signal that the neopitopes are trying to convey is drowning in other single signals provided by the, the tumor cell, but also surrounding the tumor cell that results in the neopitope signal not being heard. What we want to do in a neopitope-based personalized cancer therapy is we want to shift this balance and we want to amplify the danger signal, basically allowing the immune system to be able to hear the voices of the neopitopes. We want to provide the neopitopes with a megaphone in order for the immune system to be able to hear them better in order to fight off the, the tumor. Let me try to visualize how we would design such a, a personalized cancer therapy. This you see here is a cancer patient. Or more specifically, this is the healthy DNA of a cancer patient. This is the DNA of the tumor of this specific cancer patient. What we want to do is we want to identify these mutations that are unique to the tumor of this specific patient. And the way in which we do that is overlay the DNA of the tumor with the DNA of the healthy tissue in order to isolate the mutations. This results in potentially a list of thousands of mutations. And what we want to do is we want to, based on these thousands of mutations, we want to identify which of those are actually displayed on the surface of cells and, uh, and are able to interact with the immune system in order to inform that this tumor is actually a tumor cell. So what we want to do is we want to find the needle in the haystack. We want to find the neopitopes that will be displayed on the surface. And this is a challenging task. In principle, what we want to do is we want to actually test each of these mutations in the lab. We want to test whether they are displayed on the cell surface. And we also want to test whether they, are, they have the ability to interact with the immune system. However, as you can imagine, doing this, testing all of these in the lab would, is a highly complex task would take very long time uh, and is therefore not feasible. So we need other tools to identify these neopitopes. And this is where AI comes into the picture. An AI algorithm in the context of neopitope identification is trained on vast biological data sets that contain information about molecules that are displayed on the surface of cells. And we can use that information to identify our neotopes. An example of such data is that we take cells from lots and lots, thousands and thousands of different people. We then strip the surface of these cells for their, for their epitopes. As you can imagine, this results in an extremely long list of epitopes. What we want to do with AI is we want to look at this really long list of epitopes and we want the AI to identify patterns in these uh, epitopes that will allow us to look at similar patterns in neopitopes in order to figure out what is actually presented on the cell surface. What we do with our AI algorithm when we see, when we get a new patient and we want to see what neopitopes are unique to this patient's tumor, 
is that we use our AI and the, the AI uses all its past experience that it's learned from all of the other data it's seen. And it uses that past experience to figure out for this specific patient, which neopotopes should we be bringing out into the open? Which neopotopes, which voices should we be amplifying in order for the immune system to be able to spot the tumor? Once we've identified our neopotopes with our AI algorithm, we can go back into the lab and we can then make more of these neopotopes synthetically. We can then put these neopotopes into our personalized cancer therapy and give this back to the patient in order to amplify the danger signal and for the patient's own immune system to be able to fight off the cancer. Let me finish off by telling you a story about tomorrow based on many of the things that we can already do today. After many years in the sun, mostly without sun protection, my grandmother Harriet has developed skin cancer. She visits the hospital and the hospital decides that a personalized cancer approach would be the way to go for her. A tumor biopsy and a blood sample is taken from my grandmother. And this is the material we need to design a personalized therapy specific for her. Once she is waiting for her therapy to be produced, we'll take a look behind the scenes and see how do we actually produce this personalized cancer therapy. We look at the DNA of the healthy tissue of my grandmother, and we look at the DNA of our tumor, and this is what we use to identify the computational or computationally identify the mutational landscape of her tumor specifically. We can use the blood sample to identify the MHC, the immune molecules that are specific to her. Once we have this information, we can then use AI to extract the neopotopes that are specific to her tumor. These computational steps can, can be achieved within a matter of hours. Once we've identifi identified our neopotopes, we can go back into the lab, synthesize them, make a personalized cancer therapy specific for my grandmother. And when she comes back to the hospital, she can be given her therapy. And after some time, my grandmother's own immune system will be able to fight off the cancer. Just imagine this world of tomorrow, a world where personalization is the norm and where each cancer patient can be treated specifically based on his or her tumor. A world where each cancer patient can be given a cancer, uh, cancer treatment with no off-target toxicities and with high effectiveness in fighting off the foreignness in the body that is the cancer. Tailor-made, personalized cancer therapy driven by AI can potentially make this reality. Thank you. Hi, Emma. Thank you so much. Hello, for that, uh, hello. Thank you very much for that very, very insightful and promising uh, talk. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize. I didn't introduce you properly. This is Emma Yeba, researcher and PhD. Uh, I just wanted to correct that to make sure people know who you are. Um, but uh, listening to, to your talk um, makes me think, you know, a lot of people here uh, talk about cancer treatments a lot and you know, there's something just around the corner and, oh, this is going to be solved very soon. And I guess I'm going to ask you the same question. Mm -hmm. uh, how far are we with this kind of treatment? What's the, what's the, you know, the bottleneck if there is one? Uh, what's stopping us from, from going further with this? Mm -hmm. So as I said in the beginning, uh, that this is the future, personalization is the future. Um, and what I forgot to mention actually is that the future is much closer than you may think. Um, and that, um, that this, is actually, this is actually where we are already. Wow. So we're already able to use AI uh, specifically to look at DNA of individual patients. Mm. We're using AI in the field of medicine a lot. So we're both using it for diagnostics to see how should we treat a given patient. Mm. But now we're also starting to use it when we actually get a patient to actually design the therapy specifically for them. So we have two aspects of this. And, um, and this, this is already being, being tested. So this neoepitope-based therapy is already starting to be tested on humans. So we're actually much, much closer than, than potentially this, this uh, presentation was, was uh, wow. yeah, indicating. That is really amazing. Thank you so much for your talk.
Thank, thank you, you for listening, guys. And uh, yeah, take one off there. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening. And uh, we're just going to go for a quick break screen uh, so we can touch base with our technology. And we'll be back with you very shortly. Welcome back. Our next speaker, unfortunately, could not be with us live today. So Lisa Valicangas has sent us in a pre-recorded video. Lisa's going to be talking about how change can be a great thing, but it can also be pretty destructive if we don't know how to handle it. So please enjoy Lisa's pre-recorded video. How to lead for resilience under the urgency of now. I want to open with three factors that uh, define the environment in which we develop our capability to lead for strategic resilience. The first one is really the urgency of now, how to gain access to resources, capabilities that may take years, if not decades, to develop, but they are needed now. An example of that is the recent vaccine development effort for the pandemic we're in. Amazing feed vaccine based on technologies such as messenger RNA uh, has been completed and developed in about a year when such efforts usually take more than 10 years. This is thanks to the underlying technology being in laboratories for more than 20 years under development. The second um, transformative factor in our environment is digital management technologies, which are changing the way we represent reality by bits and pieces, kind of as digital twins, if you like. We are able to analyze, optimize, innovate these digital realities, and they are increasingly changing management processes and practices, something Again, we need to be sensitized to and learn about. The third factor is China, um, sort of a geopolitical factor, which is changing the environment in which business is going to be conducted for years to come. So in this vastly changing environment of urgencies of now, digital technologies, geopolitical changes, how do we develop the capability for our leadership and for resilience in particular. I would like to set a standard, which is zero trauma change. This is something I worked with my colleague Gary Hamill some years ago, and we published a piece in our business review. Uh, it is still quite relevant in terms of thinking about how to uh, maximize our capacity to be forward-looking, to change while minimizing the trauma, the crisis, the cost of undergoing change. Because by the time we are in that crisis, it is too late really to lead that change in any way we want to. Uh, in addition to those costs that are incurred, often change in itself has its own unfolding course when it takes place under crisis. So if you want to lead change, we need to get engaged before we fall into that crisis situation. So what might be ways in which we can develop such capability for strategic resilience in ourselves and our organizations? I propose three steps forward. They're not necessarily linear, but they give good uh, pointers as to the sort of capabilities that we need to have in our organizations for strategic resilience. The first one is our mindset, our cognitive capability to be very flexible, to see things before they really stare us at the face. We might look at um, in the outskirts for new startups that are experimenting on novel business models, for instance, or um, new technologies, blockchain comes to mind for many of us, I'm sure, that are being developed in applications that are again novel and perhaps feel like really out there. The issue often is that as we think about changes in the environment, we think, well, it doesn't really concern me, concern us, so at least it doesn't concern us yet as an organization. And this is the way disruptive innovation works. It kind of looks like it's not a relevant competitor, but then it is able to gather a large market share and then it's sort of late to develop a very effective response. 
So developing this cognitive flexibility is very, very important. As I said, one strategy is to look at Vanguard pioneering uh, business models, startups, um, entrepreneurs out there who are doing something so different that it really um, makes you think like that is exciting or that is something I am very anxious about. That's a good sign that these emotions tell you something about that is important in terms of your business. Not to copy them, but to learn from their experience. Another way we can develop uh, cognitive flexibility in organizations is to use a universal institution to our advantage. And that is the institution of gestures and humor. So in courts, all the rulers have chosen their trusted jester. This is the clown, but a wise clown that provides support, speaks truth to power, but also brings information that is relevant to the ruler in making decisions. And this is actually still relevant in today's organizations. There have been gestures in uh, British Airways. There was a guy called Paul Birch for a while, who was a senior executive who said he was able to hold the mirror to see the absurdity of some of the activities that may have taken place and people could laugh and then after that um, real change might result. Laugh in a good way, laugh together. So humor um, is such a cognitive flexibility enhancer. The second step after the cognitive mindset is strategic. How do we develop a portfolio of options that is strong enough, that is thick enough, so that we start learning about things that may pertain to the urgencies of now, to digital technologies, to geopolitical changes. And it's not just about having 1,000 investments or which one might work out, sort of like a venture capitalist might work. It is really about the thickness of the experimental portfolio, the portfolio options we have at our disposal. Because that thickness, do we have 1,000 experiments, uh, 500 learnings, maybe even more ideas, a couple of uh, sort of failures, things that we really can draw our resilience from, because those are the ways in which we learn about the world before we really need to. So again, we are, being proactive in that sense. So check the thickness of your portfolio of experiments and options. Do you have a lot to learn from? The third step in this um, path toward strategic resilience is political or resource um, uh, oriented. So what, how do we access resources that we need to have at our disposal? And it is not just about um, the typical budgeting mechanisms, but we could look more broadly. We could um, look into outside our organizations. There's a lot of talk about open innovation, for instance. There are places, um, uh, organizations that provide access to problem solvers around the world. Innocentive is one of the older ones. There was a very interesting uh, company called Gaggle bought by Google some time ago, which provided half a million data scientists to your disposal if you had a very interesting data science problem to solve. And I like the example of a gaggle because um, it sort of shows that it is possible to access resources that are in very, very short supply, such as data scientists in the world. If you have a problem that really um, grasps their interest and their imagination. I lived in Silicon Valley for a long time. There was a sort of a joke that um, it's not whether you have a computer science degree from Stanford or DTU from that matter, it's about what's your gaggle ranking. So are you part of the teams that are the most competitive, the best in solving these complex data science problems? And so that, I think, is a nice way of thinking about how can I formulate my organization's toughest problems in such a way that some of the world's smartest data scientists might be interested in addressing them. Another way might be to 
use games. Games are technologies that um, may be used, of course, for entertainment a lot, but there have also, also been many efforts, such as the Institute for the Future in California, together with Rockefeller Institute, to try and invite people to address poverty, or um, a, a game that was called Superstruct that Institute for the Future rolled out some years ago, where they invited volunteers from around the world to team up together, thinking about how to address humanity's uh, systemic uh, threats, threats to their survival. Um, and these teams thought about how to grow food in vertical um, surfaces, how to team up for rapid uh, um, intervention or help units, etc. So think about how you can go beyond the sort of resources that are characteristically allocated through a budgeting system inside the boundaries of the organization to go into out there opening up the innovation box, so to speak, but also use technologies such as games that have the capacity really to bring millions and millions of people uh, like in some of the games such as World of Warcraft together. Yes, it may be about play, but it could also be very serious about addressing some of the tough issues that we are facing. So that, might, that is the third step about resource attraction, really. Uh, so if we think about how to develop this capability for strategic resilience, we have talk, talked about how to uh, culture nurture our cognitive flexibility, whether it is through looking out there in the Bangor examples, using institutions or roles such as a gesture and humor, which of course is somewhat difficult maybe in the time of Zoom, but maybe that can still be, or Teams, um, but maybe that can still be designed into our virtual communications, whether it is um, importantly about the portfolio of strategic experimentation we are engaged in, whether that is broad enough and diverse enough to tackle and address some of the challenges facing us, the urgencies of now, digital technologies, geopolitical changes, and finally, what, are, what is our resource attraction strategies so that we are able to uh, include some of the smartest and some of the very smart people out there in our efforts to tackle the most complex problems we face. So those are the steps. And so once when you think about how to embed the capabilities for these steps in your organization, you can start then thinking about what is the renewal cycle like? How quickly or how slow did we, slowly do we go from cognitive flexibility, sort of seeing the issue, admitting that it is a time to tackle it, uh, to experimenting and resourcing it. And I've spoken to many executive audiences and typically the response has been around five years. Now, this of course depends on the industry and we might say today that we have been able to develop a faster uh, response cycle, perhaps mostly in digital communication, perhaps a little bit in new ways of doing business out of necessity. But think about whether it is five years, whether it is one year, you move from denial or this cognitive awakening, if you will, to experimentation, to resourcing, and how quickly do you go through this cycle? And of course, the important thing is to go through fast enough not to end up in a crisis, which is really a lack of strategic resilience, and also be able to do this cycling, cycling faster than your competitors to stay ahead. So that is a way to nurture strategic resilience in your organization and develop a capability for leading it in the environment that is actually quite strongly changing. So we have to really enhance our cognitive, strategic and resourcing capability. My question to you is, are you ready? Yes, Lisa, I'm ready. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, now we're going to be helping you with your resilience through this marathon of talks. Uh, we're going to go to a lunch break. And uh, yeah, again, try to get away from the screen, do a bit of motion, jump up and down, do some push-ups if you want to, try and get that energy and blood going so you, get a bit, uh, so you feel a bit better coming back. 
Um, in any case, meet us back here at two o'clock sharp. Uh, we hope to see you there very, very soon. And uh, yeah, have a fantastic break. Hello and welcome back to the second half. I hope you've had a good break and you're fresh and ready to get some more knowledge shoved into that brain of yours. All right, we'll go straight on to the next speaker. Anneli Berner is a designer, researcher, and teacher, and she's going to help us answer a question to do with ethics in the future. Ethics and future, who thought they would go together in this day and age, but it looks like they actually might. To hear a little bit more, let's invite Anneli to the stage. Come on over. Thank you. Today I'll share with you some ways to bring ethical reflection into the process of creating new technologies. To me, ethical reflection comes up when I confront situations that pull me in different directions, where I don't know what to choose, or sometimes where I think I know exactly what to choose and then everything falls apart. How could I uncover the situations that require ethical reflection before they actually happen. And why should anyone do that at all? Let's take that first. You may have seen some headlines in the past few years to the tune of how technological devices impact our lives in unexpected ways. Delightful technologies, like a stuffed animal uh, that you can use to send your kids messages, turns into an insecure database and private messages being held for ransom. A website to share and connect with your friends turns into a trove of personal data used to manipulate voters. Recognizing faces to prevent crime turns into a facial recognition system that is used to track and control ethnic minorities. The list goes on. In a recent research project, we tried to understand how to bring ethical reflection into that process of creating new technologies. We were trying to figure out how to bring ethics up earlier, as opposed to only in the aftermath of these embarrassing, shocking, horrible headlines. As something we heard was that ethics comes up when things go down. Things in this case can mean technological devices, the networks and the people and the places to which they are connected. What if we could anticipate those things going down and fast forward to the scene that brings ethics up? If we could uncover and express those scenes, we could rehearse and prepare for how we would handle the challenges we might face. And maybe when we step back to our present day concerns, we could make different choices, avert some possible scenarios and steer towards others. But in order to get there, we have to exit from our everyday focus and zoom in and out fast forward, in short, shift our perspective. And I think these lenses might help us. Ethical theories inspire those lenses and I'll call them out as we go. Let's do it. Let's use those lenses and look at a new technological device through them. See what scenarios that brings up. I hope that how I will see this is different from how you might see the, the product and the scenarios, because that is the power of diverse perspectives and the discussions that we can have with them. So perhaps you'll jot down your reflections and share them with me later um, or those around you now. So what are, what are we going to work with today? We are all going to work on the smart shoe. And it's a new product. Um, it's going to measure and log runs, walks, any kind of movement. Um, we just joined the team working on it, and it's not yet launched. Let's take a look at the thing we're building. We don't yet know exactly what its form is, so for now, this is our representation that we'll use, and we'll follow it through the lenses. Our first lens is that of zooming in. So we want to really try to get to know the product, what is inside it, who uses it. We know it has a Bluetooth device, it has a database that it's connected to, 
Um, it also has an accelerometer inside of it. And there is an app that people can use to get the data out of it. It lives on people's feet and in their houses and anywhere else they might go. The app allows people to analyze their patterns, set goals, and even compare their routes to others. Um, and we also have a smart coach who can help people improve their running style. So now we can see a bit of a fuller picture about this smart shoe. Second lens. We are looking at this thing, again, this smart shoe that we're building. But here, we're going to try to sharpen the lens and think about what good we are doing with this thing. So we already know that it's supposed to help people to run faster and better. But now that I'm joining the product team, I would also like to bring a couple other ideas in. So I'm going to bring in well-being, um, the idea that I want to support people's physical and mental well-being. And I'm also going to bring in the value of autonomy. Um, so the idea that no matter what, the person who owns this, this shoe can make their own choices without being influenced or forced by the technology inside of it. And this lens, this focus on values, is rooted in the idea of virtue ethics, where we try to always strive to uphold the values that we care about in the things that we're working on, in the choices that we make in our lives. On first glance, it looks like the smart shoe aligns fine with those values. People can choose where they want to go. They can set goals, which seems good for mental well-being, I heard, at least. But with our next lens, we're going to zoom out and look at time. So over time, what could happen if somebody lives with this thing? What are the impacts of the thing on their life? So what if in a few days, the person who owns this shoe, she's been running with it plenty, and she starts to feel a bit down. And she realizes that part of that is because she never reaches her goals. And there's this coach in her ear who's just yelling at her every day, you know, trying to motivate her, but it doesn't work. She just feels more and more down. How, does, how am I doing with that value of well-being right now? Or maybe another day she wakes up and she decides, you know what, enough. I just want to go for a run and enjoy this sport. But the thing is tracking her and analyzing her and recording her, her run, her patterns and everything. It's kind of in her mind. She can't just detach from it. So how am I doing with this autonomy value now? Can she use the shoe without being judged by the technology inside of it? So should I just put my big list of tasks aside and focus on trying to bring these values in? Maybe I should make it so that you can kind of insert the, the, the sensors and take them out when you want to take a break from being judged. Or maybe I should work on this coaching style and think about how different types of people might want to be motivated in different ways. But on the other hand, I have this big list, right? I have a lot to do. So, but how am I doing with my North Stars and those values? And I feel that they're starting to drift away. Well, our next lens, scale. So here we envision a future where lots and lots of people have our smart shoe. So loads of people in Denmark here are running around with our shoe on. And actually a lot of people even on the other side of the world are also using the shoe. And when I think about the other side of the world, I think about somewhere warm, really, really warm and sunny. Um, so how would, how would this shoe be in that warm, warm, sunny place? Well, okay, so the person over there, maybe he's going for runs and enjoying running in the sun, and all this and the smartness, it's all good. Um, and he takes breaks every 10 minutes because it's hot and he needs to drink some water. 
you know, hydrate a bit, cool down. And he also carries water with him even. So his stats are being compared to the global average and it doesn't look so good. Um, and when we, we look into things um, on our end, we realize that over here in lovely, brisk Denmark, people are running really fast to try to stay warm. <laughs> Um, and, and our context is being directly compared to his context. So how are we doing here? Feels like the consequences to some extent of, of this comparison, this, not, this is not feeling so good, it's not working so well. So should we try to push for more data collection in his area and try to get a better local average or how do we deal with this? All right, next slides. Let's look at that future, right? So already we're starting to think about different futures where, yeah, now our product is out there, right? Certainly not the present day. Um, we're not going to look very far in the future, just very, very near future. But even already there, we need to start to take into account the other things that might be happening. So at that point, very near future. I can tell you probably, and unfortunately, there will continue to be a climate crisis. And it's also quite likely that everybody is still working from home, or many, many, many people. And so there's been a kind of skyrocketing of domestic energy consumption. And there's a big push to try to, yeah, anybody who's working on a product that has to do with people's homes and their lives needs to try to promote this kind of reducing the domestic energy consumption. And our smart shoe is certainly living in people's homes. So we have to think about it. And luckily, lately, just to add one more variable here, um, there's been a big, big step forward in terms of harvesting kinetic energy. So, you know, every movement that you take is actually now turning into energy that can be stored and then used to do something like charge your phone or other devices. So that's super exciting for us. So it's cheaper, it's easier to do, more accessible. And we've decided we're going to shift and have this kind of green citizen shoe. So it's not just a smart shoe, it's now the green shoe. Um, and we're really proud of that idea and everything. But on the other side, if we add these kind of bits of computing in and so on, that means that we're actually, we need to harvest some rare earth minerals, um, and after the shoe is used, it's going to contribute to electronic waste. So this green shoe is, is also having some failings if we see it as part of a bigger global picture of greenness. All right, so here we're starting to bring in a little bit of care ethics where we see the shoe as connected not just to the people that use it, but also potentially to the earth that that those people are part of, right? All right. So through all of these stories, what I've been trying to do is to bring up these kind of challenges and the experiences of those challenges. And you may have heard of different ethics that came up throughout those stories. So we talked about consequentialism a bit as we thought about consequences and tried to weigh them. We thought about virtue ethics, especially remember with that first story, and we, we really wanted to promote mental well-being, um, but the person was not feeling so good. And in this last story, we brought up care ethics and the idea that a shoe is connected not just to an app, but to much, much more. So the stories and the scenarios that we've talked through, they bring up conflicts. But if we could actually envision them more richly, perhaps that would bring the discussion even more to life. So I wanted to share with you a student project 
lately um, from, from some students of mine who thought about that same smart shoe kind of scenario. Um, and in this case, the smart shoe is, yes, part of the kind of green citizen program, even promoted by the queen, if you can, if you can see. Um, and the idea is that the more you use the shoe, the more points you get. And those points also go towards um, discounts at the grocery store and all sorts of other kinds of benefits. So just seeing the shoe in the context of a city or in our leadership's hands maybe helps you to bring the whole story to life in your head. Um, and we can also use these lenses in this way of working to think about products, different products, so not just shoes, but actually a smart lock. And in this case, the students that I was working with, um, they thought about a future where a smart lock is um, used to regulate lockdowns. So what you see is the smart lock opening and closing in accordance with the national lockdown. And you can also use these lenses for completely other contexts, like a museum. So here, my collaborator, Monica Seyfried and I, thought about a future where there's a new software that a museum uses to try to um, collect and organize all of the different um, art pieces that it has. And in that future, um, the leadership is really trying to uh, uphold the value of sustainability, reduce their energy consumption, um, and they, they even try to almost program or train the software to help them be more sustainable in their collection. And what this, what this results in is that the software learns that actually many of these sculptures and paintings and archives are collecting, are using a lot of energy in order to preserve them. Um, and it starts to delete them. So, None of these scenarios or questions were the ethical future, but they depict and sometimes foresee the challenges that we may face in multiple possible futures. And in doing so, they give us signs for what we could start to do now. And we ran through a lot. I hope that you will take one, if not several lenses into your next decisions and ask questions that slow you down and trust that by doing so, you are on your way to designing an ethical future. Thank you. Hi, Adelaide, thank you so much for a very thought-provoking talk. Um, yeah, super interesting. I uh, was sitting back there and, and, uh, and thinking that this method that you're using to, to sort of you know, take something new and see what it's like in the future, and if we, you know, for, for the sake of uh, you know, imagination or conversation, if we look backwards instead and we mm. looked at technologies that exist and if we applied these methods to them, would we have those technologies today? One thing that comes to mind is something like atomic energy and the way that we use that or, you know, Jurassic Park kind of stuff with dinosaurs and that kind of thing. Mm. Do, uh, do you think there's an application there that we can sort of retrofit, I guess, uh, technologies that exist? Yeah, um, well, it's a great question. And thank you for that. I think, um, so, no, I, of course, I don't have an answer, as usual, but, um, but what, I, what I'm thinking is that in order to imagine um, alternatives to that, yeah, that decision that they were making at the time, mm -hmm. which was maybe whether to develop that kind of technology or not, mm. um, perhaps... First of all, we now have to kind of get into their worldview mm -hmm. and think about what, and on a kind of bigger scale, what was their view or their kind of ideas of how they would make their progress towards their goals or their kind of virtues, their ideas of who they wanted to be, what they wanted that technology to do right. in the world, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Yeah, I'm actually curious if, if it would be possible to present 
scenarios that would kind of destabilize them or push them off of that worldview that, um, or rather make them question that worldview. Because yeah. I'm not sure exactly what is right or wrong mm -hmm. in that scenario of whether to develop that new technology or not. Um, but I am, I am quite sure that it would, no matter what, be productive to try to kind of push people off of their high horse and mm -hmm. let them take, help them to take a look at um, other possible consequences of yeah. what they were building. Definitely. And I do, I do think <clears throat> that um, techniques like immersion um, in these scenarios could have helped or maybe they even did it, but mm. at least if I could go back there and try, I would, I would definitely try to immerse those, those people who were developing this new thing right. into those kind of scenarios and see whether it changed their minds, whether it made them think mm. different things, evaluate their values yeah. um, kind of differently even. Yeah. What, what do you think? Yeah. Oh, don't ask me. I'll be on for <laughs> Well, I'm not the expert, but it was a very interesting insight, at least. Uh, yeah. I wish we could send you back in time to fix some stuff, at least. Maybe that would be make a better world for the future. No. But thank you so much, Emily. Thank um, you. I'm going to introduce our next speaker straight away, so just uh, head on off when you're ready. Okay. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks. All right. So, uh, from one ethical dilemma, perhaps, to another. Uh, our next speaker, Tim Booth, is going to give us a little bit of insight in, into uh, how we can perhaps exploit nature's resources for our benefit without blowing it to hell. So, Tim, why don't you come onto the stage? Thanks, Trent. As humans, throughout history, we've tended to use the inherent structure of materials to our advantage. When my family moved back to Europe, we lived in a place where the soil contained a lot of chalk. Chalky soils can sometimes contain a kind of stone called flint. Flint's an incredibly exciting material if you're a kid or if you're a cave person, and there's quite a lot of overlap there. If you hit a good quality piece of flint with another stone, you can get a very nice ringing noise, like a bell. If you hit it harder, you can get pieces to fall off. The process is called conchoidal fracture, and the shape of the piece of flint you get is a result of the direction that shock waves move in the material. These pieces are incredibly sharp and I mean incredibly sharp. The edge of a piece of flint can be hundreds of times sharper than the best surgeon's scalpel. They can have an edge that's just a few tens of atoms thick and can leave a much cleaner cut than a traditional knife. You can use sharp edges like this to cut through really thin slices of sample, just a few tens of nanometers thick, to look at under the most powerful electron microscopes. Glass knives have long been considered a possible alternative to metal scalpels in surgery because cuts made this way heal up faster and with less scarring. As a kid, learning how to make flint knives and arrowheads was a great way to spend an afternoon and maybe lose an eye in the process. Out in Norwich in England, there's a place called Grimes Graves, where about four and a half thousand years ago, Stone Age people discovered large deposits of flint, and they produced one of the world's first industrial landscapes. Thanks to their mining activity, Grimes Graves looks like the surface of the moon. Using deer antlers for pickaxes, they dug up to 14 meters below the ground to get to the flint. To give you an idea of the scale of the operation and the demand for flint, we think that these folks might have brought more than 18,000 tons of flint up to the surface by hand. And that's just based on the number of mine shafts that have been discovered today. At this surface, the flint could have been turned into more than a million stone axes. And these axes were exported and sold all across Europe. <clears throat> Remember that we're talking about Neolithic people here. They've only just invented farming, and now it's Amazon Prime for stone tools. In fact, farming was what drove demand for flint tool technology. Even after metal tools were developed, flint was so good and cost-effective that people continued using it for the next two and a half millennia. I'd argue that improvements in productivity and efficiency, faster farming and better hunting and gathering, was what gave people enough time to sit around inventing Bronze Age technology in the first place. I think that the people who designed and worked the mines figured out how to bring the flint to the surface and then craft it into stone tools were engineers, scientists, and artists in their own right. All this progress, technology, industry, just based on our understanding of how to break up rocks. Now that I've grown up a bit, I've stopped trying to make lethal weapons to throw at my friends, 
So I work as a scientist. I do research into two-dimensional materials, and these materials have caused something of a revolution in a few different scientific fields. 2D materials can be just a few atoms thick, and there are many that are just a single atom thick. The structure of these materials varies depending on the direction you look in. This is called anisotropy. This anisotropy is really important for making two-dimensional materials, and it's the key to understanding their properties. We usually start with a mineral, like graphite, which is a naturally layered structure. Graphite is made of layers and layers of carbon atoms, all joined into sheets called graphene sheets and stacked on top of one another. Graphite's a bit like a deck of playing cards, and now we want to find out if we can take a single card out of the pile. It turns out that we can, which is amazing, because this graphene layer is only a single atom thick, and yet you can touch it, move it around, get it to stick across a hole like a soap bubble. What's even more amazing is that this single layer has very different properties to graphite. And that's true of a lot of 2D materials, and there are thousands now. If you take out one, or just a few layers of the material, the properties and behavior of these layers can be rather unexpected. They can be very different from the crystal you started with. It's a bit like if you're a paleontologist and you're splitting open rocks to reveal total surprises. Crack! Look, there's a fern frond inside this one. Crack! Here's a shell. Crack! This process of discovery, the splitting action of the hand and the mind to understand what lies within, is really the heart of what we call analysis. We break problems into smaller pieces so that we can understand them more easily and so that nature can surprise us by revealing its structure. It makes sense that we have to choose how we break the problem apart quite carefully to get the best answer. What's been completely mind-blowing in the field of two-dimensional materials recently is if you really carefully put the layers back together again in a slightly different way, maybe deliberately misaligned, you can make an entirely new material with even more unexpected properties. I don't have a good analogy for this, it doesn't happen in normal life. It's like if we took our fern frond fossil and our shell fossil and we banged them together and a dinosaur jumped out. It's not even entirely true that it's 100% unexpected. Some people actually managed to correctly predict that dinosaur. 2D materials have some really promising applications in electronics, energy storage and material science. They've been used to make new superconducting systems, fast and efficient transistors, better batteries and supercapacitors, super and the potential applications just keep on coming. So while I'd love to talk to you today about 2D materials, the organizers won't let me have the whole day. And to give you a proper idea of what's going on, I'd have to invite hundreds of researchers doing amazing things across many different disciplines. What I do want to give you today is an idea, maybe a, a new way to look at science and technology. I think some of the technologies that we rely on are set up in opposition to nature, rather than using the best of what's already there. Like the flint, like the graphite, by carefully studying the structure of what nature's already given us, we can really pull in the same direction. But what do I mean by technology in opposition to nature? I mean going against the natural direction, not using diversity and anisotropy to our advantage. Going in the wrong direction usually costs us more energy and has a worse outcome. In one example from my research, we show that if you want to cut up a two-dimensional material, it's a lot easier to do this well along particular directions. In some directions, and with some processes, we can end up with almost atomically smooth edges. And this gives us a real advantage when we want to do something as difficult as pattern materials with atomic precision. Just like splitting up wood, it's much easier to make a straight edge in some directions than in others. We're learning that we have to be very sensitive to the underlying structure of the materials around us to get the best out of them. I think there are a few areas where young engineers and scientists might try to apply a similar thinking. For most of my career, I've been working with carbon, but another of the chemical elements that's really important for us is nitrogen. Nitrogen is the neighbor of carbon on the periodic table, and it makes up about 70% of the air we're breathing right now. Nitrogen in the air is very unreactive because it normally binds chemically with itself. In 2D materials research, we like to say that the bonds between carbon atoms in a layer of graphene are very strong, but the bonds between atoms in nitrogen molecules are nearly twice as strong as those in graphene. As a result, it's really difficult to get nitrogen out of the air and into the chemicals we need. And we need a lot of nitrogen-containing chemicals. Fertilizers, explosives, refrigeration agents, plastics, dyes, textiles. The main way we do this is by first making a nitrogen-containing chemical called ammonia, which you may remember from chemistry class in school. The problem is the best way we've found to do this so far is using a process called the Harbour process. Now, the harbour process was developed during World War I so that countries could produce nitrogen-containing compounds without having to rely on the major source of nitrogen compounds at the time, which was guano, 
bird and bat droppings from Chile. In the harbour process, we combine hydrogen with nitrogen from the air under really high temperature and pressure, 500 degrees Celsius and 200 atmospheres. Remember that nitrogen is really unreactive. We have to use these high temperatures and pressures to make the ammonia. When the process was invented more than 100 years ago, it was a major breakthrough. It was hugely important at the time because, as a species, we were really interested in producing more explosives for World War I. At the time, natural gas seemed to be a cheap and limitless source of energy, and there wasn't much of an understanding about the effect burning so much fossil fuel would have on the environment. The problem that I see is that we're still running this process today. It's estimated that the harbour process consumes up to 2% of the total energy budget of the planet, or about the same as 40,000 coal-fired power stations. The same process results in over 1% of total green, global greenhouse gas emissions, equivalent to burning about a billion barrels of oil every year. There are many ways we might solve this challenge. Some of my colleagues work on designing new catalysts, which are usually anisotropic crystalline materials that can reduce the energy cost of this kind of reaction. This is a really important direction. We could also ask chemists and biologists to look at natural sources. Nature already produces hundreds of billions of tons of nitrogen-containing polymer every year. It's called chitin, and it forms the shells of shellfish and other sea life, exoskeletons of insects, and it's also in fungus and yeast. What's even better is that chitosan, a material closely related to chitin, is an excellent fertilizer, and it was even the world's first biopesticide. It could displace a major use of nitrogen compounds. Artificial fertilizer happens to be what 80% of the harbor process outputs are used for anyway. Chitosan is totally edible and safe, and it's been used in medicine to make wound dressings that help people to heal. Chitosan can even act as a platform compound to produce many chemicals we would normally make from oil. We just need more research to make it happen. What we need to do today is take a good look around us, and I think to reevaluate some of our technologies, to look in the directions we're pulling in and try to figure out whether we're pulling in the same directions as those found in nature. We might be surprised by what we find. Thank you. Hi, Tim. Thank you so much for that. That was very interesting. It was a pleasure. Uh, I had no idea Flint was so important. Okay, it's very important. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I was sitting and thinking uh, about you know, the implications of what you were saying uh, in terms of you know, the stuff that we get out of nature now to help us live and you know, move and develop and yes. you know, progress and all that. And uh, one of the things that I was thinking about was something like fuel, petrol and that, or gas if you're American, uh, all that kind of stuff. Like how, how, do we, uh, how do we sort of get over that leap? I mean, obviously, the sustainable resources and that kind of thing, but it's happening now, right? It's a great question. It's a, it's a hugely important question, of course, because we, you know, we, 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 we've grown up and we've used, we use a lot of energy. Mm. I mean, for, throughout most of our history, petrochemicals has been a fantastic and seemingly limit, limit, limitless source of both the base chemicals that we need and, and, and energy by, through burning them. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be very difficult to replace that. I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of potential options in terms of uh, producing new fuels for the future, much more sustainable ones. For example, there are, there are biofuels uh, based on um, cellulose and lignans um, that can replace diesels. And we're looking at bioethanol, which already in many countries performs the role of an additive um, to maybe 5 or 10 percent in, in, in fuels. So I think more of this looking at, looking at natural cycles in nature and figuring out how nature does it, and then, and, then, and then providing a, a cycle to, to mimic nature in this way mm -hmm. um, will, will help us achieve those goals. I tend to think, you know, taking the best out of nature still means taking from nature, but we can do it in a bit more of a sensitive way than we have been doing, I think. Wow, okay. Thank you so much for that, Tim. That was super interesting. Very welcome. Thank uh, you. I'll introduce the next speaker, so please just head up you. when you're ready. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, our next speaker is uh, an oldie but a goldie. Um, it's one that's strangely poignant for the world we're living in right now and uh, eerily relevant. Uh, please enjoy this, uh, this video from 2015 by uh, Bill Gates talking about, uh, you know, the next big outbreak and where we are we ready. Hey guys, and welcome back. I hope you've had a refreshing break. Let's move on to our next installment. Hey, where do weird and wacky ideas come from? 
OKGO, OK who uh, presented at a TEDx in 2017, have an in-depth answer to that question. So please enjoy. Wow. I will never feel uh, adequate again when I'm planning. That was, uh, that was amazing. Thank you. Uh, go. OK, go. There it is. Thank you. OK, go. Uh, our next talk is uh, kind of asking, asking the question, is it possible to uh, you know, use your own satellite? Is this even a thing that's possible? Well, someone who's going to help us answer that question is Abdul Hakim Abdi, and he's going to come and tell us a little bit about that area now. Come on in, Hakim. As most of us know, uh, our planet is going through a lot of changes. Climate change, biodiversity declines, polluted oceans, intensive land use, and so on. But Earth is a big place. And there's one tool at our disposal that provides us with the big picture about the health of our planet. And that tool is Earth-observing satellites. And we're in a revolution of sorts when it comes to Earth observation that's been a long time in the making. In 1957, when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite, it opened up the era of Earth observation. And as you would expect from the height of the Cold War, a lot of these satellites had uh, secret military objectives and their data were classified and not available to the public. In 1972, NASA launched Landsat 1, which was the first civilian satellite to provide global coverage of the Earth's land surface. Since then, satellites have really transformed how we see and what we know about our planet. In particular, satellites have really shown us how our planet is changing. I think we're living in a golden age when it comes to Earth observation. And I say this for four main reasons. The first reason is that over the past 10 years, more satellites, more civilian satellites have been launched into orbit than at any decade prior. And it's getting increasingly more cost effective to build, launch, and deploy satellites. For example, CubeSats, like the one you see that's being built in this image, are bigger, are about as big as a loaf of bread and are made of commercial grade uh, electronic components that are relatively inexpensive. The second reason is free and open access to satellite data. In 2008, NASA opened up its Landsat archive going back to 1972, that launch you saw earlier. And every Landsat data since then will be free to the public. Similarly, uh, the European Commission's Copernicus program, which has several, pro several satellites in orbit at the moment and several more are planned in the future, is also based on an open data policy. Other countries that have national space programs, like Japan, for example, also provide some of their satellite data available to the public. What all this means is increased accessibility to satellite data and data products for the public. The third reason is the growth of uh, parallel computing and increase in processing power. Think about it. It was only 15 years ago that Intel launched uh, the Pentium D, which was its first consumer-grade uh, dual-core processor. Today, you can get a processor with roughly eight times the number of cores for about the same price as in 2005. On top of that, we have tech behemoths like Google and Amazon and Microsoft that provide a cloud computing infrastructure where you can get near unlimited 
space for, uh, for satellite data, as well as insane computing power for relatively low price. The fourth and final reason I think we're in a golden age is uh, the increasing popularity of machine learning and shared knowledge repositories. The thing about machine learning is that it is capable of extracting information and patterns from satellite data with uh, increasing levels of accuracy. And access to machine learning has never been easier than it is today. Uh, there are tons of online tutorials and shared knowledge repositories like uh, GitHub, where people post, uh, post their code for others to use and build upon. And there are also uh, structured online programs uh, like Udemy or Coursera for anyone who wants to delve deeper into machine learning. All of this has been great for science. Uh, we've been able to uh, map and quantify and measure aspects of our planet that we never thought were possible 20, 30 years ago. For example, in the last couple of years, uh, we've been able to uh, map uh, whales in the world's oceans, trees in the deserts, individual elephants in complex savanna landscapes, and even albatrosses, which are large seabirds on remote islands in the Antarctic. In a way, satellites have become sort of a macroscope on our planet, engaging its health. But you're probably wondering, what does this mean? What does all this mean? What does it mean for you to be in this golden age of Earth observation? It means a real democratization of data and science. It means that anybody with a computer and an internet connection can download satellite data, process it using open source tools, and extract information for their own use. It's that simple and is right at our fingertips. To give you an example of what this combination can do, these 13 lines of code that you see here uh, produce an index that can tell you how green any given location on Earth is. This is from Google's online platform called Earth Engine, where with just a Google account, users can manipulate large amounts of satellite data at global scales. You don't even have to write a single line of code because lots of examples like this are already provided and the data is there as well. This one uses data from the Landsat 8 satellite. So you're probably wondering, like, what does this index of greenness look like, right? It looks like this, where the green areas show you healthy vegetated areas, uh, the brown and the yellow are either stressed or no vegetation. And because it's an image from a single season, the white areas are, are places that are covered by clouds. And in a lot of ways, a few lines of code is really all you need to extract information like this from satellite data. And you can do it globally and it has real practical applications for landscape planning or for conservation. You can even use it to assess the quality of life in cities. As research has shown that greener neighborhoods have higher quality of life. Other examples include merging different kinds of satellite data to map different aspects of the land surface. For example, here, where uh, users can merge uh, optical satellite data with data on the elevation of the land surface, combine it in a ready-made, ready-to-go algorithm called principal component analysis to extract geologic maps for uh, exploration of minerals, for example. You can also go back in time, because we do have that archive going back 50 years, and see the development of road networks. You can go online, download data from the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and see how the urbanization took place in a city, for example, like Dubai, over here. Or maybe you live in a rural setting, and you're interested to find out the distribution of crops in your area. So you go to the fields, you take a few samples of the crop types, 
sunflowers here, beets there, cereals there. You combine that information with satellite data in a machine learning framework, and you map the crop distribution where you live. Let's be honest. We don't know our planet as much as we think we do. And because of this, the possibilities of what can be done with satellite data are truly exciting. With all this uh, data and tools readily available, we're really accelerating the rate at which uh, scientific discoveries are made. So the two things I want you to get from this presentation, the two takeaways are that satellite data are available and they're accessible to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Akim. That was uh, super interesting. Um, it does beg the question, though, uh, when we're talking about this democratization of data, as you call it, right? And it's easily accessible, and you're, at least it's accessible, right? Uh, I guess there is a security issue that pops up in my head. Uh, do you have any comments about that or any worries about that yourself? Security issues? Mm -hmm. uh, no. Like data leaks, stuff like that. No, I mean, I think uh, users can download the data that informs them about their environment and their surroundings. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody has the right to understand <laughs> what is going on in their surroundings. Right. And I think that uh, the ease of, uh, of, of accessibility to satellite data kind of gets the middleman out of the way, where users can actually download the actual data. And I'm not talking about you know, uh, photographs. I'm talking about actual biophysical data, where users can manipulate different parameters and extract information about their surroundings. I mean, you might look at a satellite image where you live and you see, oh, there's a, uh, a leak going on somewhere that's killing all the vegetation and that might impact your water quality. You know, things like that. Right. Where um, in, in, in a lot of ways, um, users are, are kind of, um, how do you say, uh, they are uh, babied into believing certain things mm -hmm. that may, not, may or may not seem uh, realistic, right. but with satellite data, you can actually go and see for yourself what's going on, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, industrialization and things like deregulation, where you can uh, be better informed about your environment. Okay, very good. Do you, do you use it where you are right now? Have you used it personally? I'm thinking, uh, you know, you're a researcher yes. at Lund University, uh, beautiful Lund. Uh, is there anything you've uh, you've uh, tried to use this uh, this method or this this not method this opportunity for yourself? Well, yeah, I mean, I've I've uh, for example, I've I've used it to to map uh, uh, the crop distribution in in the region where where, ah. where we live, for example. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it was just it was not uh, part of a particular project. It was just I was just curious to see you know what kind of crops are around. Where, where I live, and uh, that's a lot of rapeseed that, that's being grown. <laughs> Just in case the apocalypse comes, right? You don't know what's around. So thank you so much, Akim. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I'll invite the next speaker to the stage. I'll just ask you to go this way if you can. Thank you so much. All right. So our uh, final speaker for today is going to ask the question, do you play anymore? And if you don't, maybe this person will tell you why you should. Please welcome Liz Zucco, blogger, author, and researcher. How children get digital empowerment by playing. I like to play. I like to be silly doing useless things. It's great to immerse yourself, forget the time, and just play. Just be present in something exciting and forget about time and place. When I was a kid, I played every day. I played games inside and outside. We played ball and was running around doing nothing and everything. We played with dolls and train tracks. And sometimes we were astronauts. But I forgot to play. I grew up. Then luckily I had kids and then I could play again. Then they grew up and I did not play anymore. But then I became part of the coding pirates and now I'm playing again. I'm an adult now, math teacher, and crazy about technology in school. I teach math as a math teacher and technology comprehension. <clears throat> technology comprehension is teaching children about the good life in a digital age to give them digital skills 
to be children in a time where technology is taking up more and more space in our everyday lives. To have an amazing childhood. To live the good, safe life with technology. But what is play? Play is activities without purpose. It's a way to practice life. In school, we can play, but it's often with a pro professional purpose. We always need to do something. We always have tests, trials and exams in front of us. Everyone wants to do well, but we are not teaching the children to be participants in a future society, but in a society that no longer exists. We can use the play to change the school. We can provide space to play, not only during recess, but also during classes. We can do experiments, studies, and solve open tasks and tasks from the reality. Playing are experiments. It's driven by curiosity. It's often sensual. It's out in the world. It makes use of materials in time and space requires concepts and knowledge. Remember the experiment, said one of my wise friends, Stina Ising Doon from the University of Olbo. She had made soap bubbles in frosty weather. I play at home. It is to dance during a break at a team's meeting, to knit a hat without a pattern, to do experiments in the kitchen, to make your own soap, to do something, something crazy just because you can do it and then hope it goes well, but laugh when it goes wrong. I needed a Santa hat for my grandson, Walter. He's so small. It grew so big that he can grow it in it for the next 10 or 20 years. Every day I see children playing with technology. I see them producing movies, playing games, make animation, coding apps. They have replaced the draft booklet with the technological possibilities, but we still give them notebooks and copy sheets in school, books and homework. The technology is natural for the kids because they are curious about it. They are digital brave, they are creative, they have imagination. They love to hear good stories about technology and stupid ways to use it. I bought a green screen for my school and the children said, wow, you have a green screen and they saw the opportunities. The adults said, what is it? It takes up too much space. Then the children had to make movies with a green screen about online surf safety. They played with the possibilities. They were creative. They failed. They tried in a new way. They had different roles. Some were photographers, actors, assistants, sound people, etc. They were in flow and community. They became wise about online security. They learned new words and concepts about online safety while playing. The children have transferred the playing to the technology. They are now practicing becoming digital competent children and later adults during playing. Do children leave school with the right and modern competences? This school does not always equip the children for the future. This school must keep up with the times and the reflect the surrounding community. This school must ensure equal opportunities for all children So we must look at the academic content in school. What skills do the children need to have? I believe that children must be good at getting ideas, being creative and innovative. They must be good at making digital productions, work together. They must be able to communicate their results and knowledge. They must be good at seeking out knowledge. They must understand technology green transition, climate, consumption, nutrition, and physical and mental health, education, and relationship in relation to their own lives. It's important for our democracy that the schools keep up with the times and the student becomes competent citizens in our society. I think the schools need a proper cleaning 
and updating to contemporary standards. School haven't changed. Society have changed. What would you have liked to learn in school? What is digital empowerment for children? Digital empowerment is when children understand digital artifacts, opportunities, intentions, and consequences. They know what you find in the machine room behind the technology. They know the consequences of cookies and understand why Alexa is not just a good friend. We pay with our data for the free services because nothing is free online. They can work with digital productions and even make their own inventions. They can imagine what they can use the technology for when they develop with it themselves. And it's important knowledge for children and young people who have grown up with direct access to the internet, sometimes without filters. I volunteer at Coding Pirate, and here I see children learn to code by being curious and by playing. They are playing and learning. They have great digital courage. They learn faster and faster and have imaginations and ideas. They get a language so they can talk to others about technology and engineering. I just tell you a good story. We just got a new department of coding parts in New Greenland. We held online meeting with the volunteers in New and in Copenhagen, and then workshops on Saturdays with children in Denmark and Greenland. The children of the two countries work on the same tasks and program, and we created creative and fun fantasy worlds in co-spaces. The teacher or instructor was in Denmark. The, the children were happy and curious about each other. We saw the snow in Greenland, and they saw the rain in Denmark. The kids showed each other their digital productions, and we clapped together because we learned together because we have the internet. We need to be healthy in body and mind, have a life and balance. We must learn to set the boundaries for technology so it, that it does not take over our lives, but make our lives better. If we use the technology smartly, we can have more time to be together, play, be family. If we do not use the technology smartly, it takes over our lives and we only know each other through a screen. We, we become addicted to technology and it limits our lives and steals our time. We need to teach the children to use computers and mobile phones in school for life. For many children, it's just entertainment and a pastime, but it can easily be used for play, math, communication, production, knowledge sharing, learning, and much more in common with peers. The schools focuses on exam, grades, and tests. But the children need skills, knowledge, motivation, and curiosity. And they can learn this through technology, play, and community. We need the students to be competent and able to act, to develop and work with experiments, think independently, be critical, be innovative. We need the girls to take a uh, technological education as well. We need the girls to be able to create the technology, have knowledge of technology, and help shape our common digital future. All children and young people have the right to be taught technology comprehension. It's a perfect way to show a student what you can do with technology, and for some it may be the start of the dream education. Most important is to have a good life in a digital age. It's the most important thing. I have a class with students aged 15, 16 in technology comprehension, and I see students who have learned to code. They have learned it because they are interested and because they have discovered how smart it is to have digital skills for life, for education, for the future. They did not learn it in school. They learned it on the internet. I dream about a life and a school for all children, where they will be prepared for the future, where they will become competent and ready, a good life, where all their dreams can be fulfilled, and where there's a place in society for all of them. We must take care of our democracy and our lives. 
I often find that they do not talk to other adults about their digital life. The, pa- the parents ask the children how it went to school today, but they must also ask, how was your digital life today? It's not good for children to be alone on the internet. The adults must be part of the children's digital life. The school should not be exam, test, grades, but learning, well-being, play, and necessary and present and future skills. The school needs a major cleaning so that a solid platform can be found for technology comprehension. Practice and culture need to change in school. The children are brave. They are researching and experimenting with technology. They are curious and full of great ideas. They have an open mindset towards technology. But it is the adults who decide. And the adults have forgotten to play. The adults use technology in an adult way. But perhaps the children's way of using the technology is much smarter and creates much more learning. They try and fail and try again. Have you ever been challenged by technology? My best advice is to think and learn like a curious child. Children are still playing, but they are also playing with the technology. Computers, robots, programming, drones, coding, virtual reality. And we all must play more in schools. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you. It's uh, amazing. Thank I, you. Uh, I got a question for you. Oh. Um, surprise, surprise. Oh. Um, <clears throat> I'm thinking now uh, we're in Corona times. Yeah. Right. And parents are stuck at home with their kids. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, based on on what you've you've talked about today, and and I guess a need or or at least an interest that that kids have, yeah. and and an adult sort of yeah. inaccessibility, to yeah. it, at least up here. Yeah. What is your one piece of advice you would give parents to help facilitate that play with children, help facilitate that online life? They could start playing cards. Cards, like physical cards. Physical cards. Yeah. It's a way of playing and learning math. They could go outside and make soap bubbles in frosty weather. They could make experiments in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They could do so many things at home. And they could burn all the uh, copy sheets. (laughs) All the copy sheets? Copy. All the copy sheets. (laughs) Burn those too, right? Yeah, burn those too, yeah. Thank you so much, Liz. That was wonderful. Uh, Thank you. Please make a reference stage. Thank you. We'll wrap up. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. This marks the end of the, uh, the TEDx conference that we are having. And I hope you guys enjoy it. As an organizer, I can only thank you a lot for being there and uh, being there and enjoying it. And I hope, you know, you will go home or in this case, you know, go from one room of your home to another room of your home with more profound ideas and more, a new way to approach life. So, but TEDx Technical University of Denmark did not start uh, just with me, you know. It started with a lot of organizers and a lot of people played their roles in completing this project. So it will be unfair of me to take all the credits and I would like to invite uh, all the organizers on the stage one by one for that. Starting with Chris. (laughs) Chris is responsible for all the speakers. So if you enjoyed all the speakers, you must thank to Chris. (laughs) Uh, Next one is Esther. Esther took care of all the logistics and she all, today she also took care of the Zoom. So, yes. Thank you, Esther. <laughs> Next one is Alvaro. Uh, Alvaro is the man behind all the uh, funny, all the technique, all the designs that you have seen of the TEDx logo and all the promotions. And he's also the handler of our social media channels. So thank you for that. <laughs> and Vios. Vios helped us with all the, with writing uh, these grants using his newly profounded Danish skills. And <laughs> that was really great. And you know, this is, this way we could uh, spend a lot of more money. <laughs> so thank you for that. 
And then there is Dasha. She is not here with us today, but she also uh, made a, an important role in this conference. So thanks to her as well. And uh, finally, I would just say that, you know, this was a journey of four months. And in these four months, we saw a lot of ever-changing Corona guidelines. And, you know, without these guys, it wouldn't have been possible. So thank you really a lot. And thank you for making it fun. Uh, lastly, I would also th say thanks to our student organization, BEST, Copenhagen, uh, for providing us with all the materials and all the uh, resources to make this event happen and all the volunteers who are still working somewhere. I don't know. But yeah, so thanks a lot for that. And finally, I would also like to thank uh, the DTU itself for providing us this great infrastructure to hold the event and Philip Binning for giving us a green signal to go forward with this event. and. Yeah, I also forgot uh, Trent uh, for bringing his beautiful comments and beautiful sense of humor uh, through the TEDx conference. So thank you all. And to all the viewers, I wish you good health and prosperity. And hopefully next time we will be seeing each other in physical appearance. Thank you.